the Polyglot Gathering is brought to you by italki. Become fluent in any language. Technology that you can uh, use when you learn languages. And uh, also language learning has been the object of study. That's another connection between the two. So there were people who studied how people learn languages. Um, there is L1 and L2 learning. Um, L1 is the native language, the mother tongue, and pedo linguistics is the field that um, is concerned with that. It will not concern us here. It's also an interesting topic, but uh, not uh, not for today. And the second one is in, in German called Sprachlehrforschung. It's the study of how you um, how you learn a foreign language or a second language. This is this is the two stands for second, of course, second language. And uh, even hyperpolygons have been investigated, though much remains to be done here. And there are many other connections between linguistics and language learning. Uh, some facts uh, are these. Uh, being a good linguist and being a good language, uh, foreign language speaker is by no means the same. The difference can also... Uh, the difference is a bit like some, whether someone can describe horses well or cure them as a veterinary or whether he can ride horses well. That's, that's about that difference. In recent years, the word linguist has sometimes been employed incorrectly for polyglot, so that's not the correct meaning of the word linguist, right? Um, some linguists do not want to show their own practical abilities of, in languages. Uh, out, out of fear, but uh, if, if they are not so good at actually speaking languages, that, that doesn't imply necessarily that, that they are bad linguists. And my claim is, uh, one of my basic claims in this, talks is, in this talk is, the university world and the polyglot community should not remain unconnected. We should have more connections between universities and um, language learners and the polyglot community, uh, which is here. Uh, one of the goal, uh, goals here of my talk is to increase the speed of language learning by use of linguistics. I give some information about that. So, my second point, on the relationship of language learning and linguistics. Uh, generalities uh, for language learning, there's not really a need to know a lot about linguistics, so don't worry if you don't know anything or if you don't know much about linguistics, there's not really a need to know a lot about that, but it's useful, it can be recommended very much. It depends on the branch of linguistics, more useful is for example phonetics, typology, so, um, uh, historical linguistics, I will explain why historical linguistics and Sprachlehrforschung, the study of how second languages are learned. Less useful are, for example, grammar theories and uh, generativism or philosophy of language or that um, has, has a few relations to, to this topic. Um, there is no really, not really a need to be aware of language structures. If you can absorb them automatically, that's fine, but uh, often it, it doesn't really work and it's an advantage to know something about, uh, about how, how it works. Uh, my tip is become a bit of a linguist yourself and explore things. The more exotic the language, the more important this is. I remember um, to tell a personal story in 1985 when I was a teenager. I learned Finnish and I had a bad book for it. I had to analyze the whole language myself in order to figure out how the grammar works. And that was a training as a linguist somehow, you know. That's how it started. Um, for those who want to learn something individual, for example, no, there are about 5,000 languages in the world and only for a small minority there are textbooks or courses. I would guess that for 200 or 400 languages maybe there are courses or textbooks, for the other ones there are no courses. So what you need then is field work, for example, you go to the place where the language is spoken, you, you interview people and in this way you learn the language gradually, but that lasts much, much longer, it's a complicated way of course. Um, so, someone can be an excellent linguist, but not have much practical knowledge in languages, and uh, not even in the language he investigates. And also, the other way around, um, or let me say this first, it, it, some linguists also investigate dead languages, and then there's no need to speak them. And the other way around, someone can be a good language learner, but need not be able to contribute something to linguistics. Um, uh, someone, some, some people are both. For example, Stephen Vorm is a famous linguist. He investigated languages in New Guinea and Australia, among others, and he spoke 40 languages. And that was not, not just that he said that, but we, we actually heard him speaking Mongolian, for example, and he spoke that well, and we heard him speak Persian, he spoke that well, so that, is a, that was uh, proved and, and checked in this way. And. Um, I claim a good linguist for a language uh, should also have some practical knowledge of that language and the other way around, a good learner of a language uh, would also profit from, some, from knowing some linguistic background of, of that language. 
There's no entire need either way, but it's, it, it's an advantage in both cases. Now on typology, uh, what is typology? Typology is concerned with the similarities and differences in language structures. If you have gotten used to the SOV structure, subject, object, verb structure in one language, this helps with another one who has that too. If you have understood aspect in one Slavic language, you can transfer it to another one if things work in the same way, otherwise you have to make modifications then, right? Language families is a topic that I want to talk about briefly. Uh, the word related applied to languages means that uh, languages stem from the same source, uh, from one language, and then there are family trees. Um, language families are, for example, Indo-European, the largest lang language family in, in, uh, as to the number of speakers. Uralic is another language family with Finnish and Hungarian, for example, Sino-Tibetan is the one with Chinese and Tibetan. Uh, they have branches, they have sub-branches, and so on. Then there are language isolates, like Basque and Korean. We don't know the relatives, which relatives they have. There are theories about it. And um, an up-to-date view on, on the language families and isolates is, is needed. Sometimes there's progress in such matters. For example, on Nardini, uh, the language family in, in North America, or Kartvelian, and there's a language in Pakistan called Birushiski, which is related to Kartvelian. That's, that's a new insight, and Kartvelian is in the southern Caucasus region. Language of relationship usually has a strong effect um, there are similarities then in the languages that are related. For example, in Indo-European languages you often have three genders and there's semantic change which um, then messes things up. For example, the, the English word gift and the German word gift mean different, mean different things. Uh, it's historically the same word, but uh, the, the German word gift means poison and uh, is, uh, so this is a false friend, but historically it's the same and jokes are possible with that. I will now say something about sound laws. That, that's important. That's one of the main messages that I have. Uh, for example, if you have data from Latin to Italian, you observe that the Latin short I's, the I, has developed into E in Italian. For example, siccus, which, which means dry, developed to sicco in Italian. And you have lots of words in, in, in which this is always the case. You always have a short I in, in, uh, in Latin, and you then have uh, an E in uh, a closed E in, in Italian, and uh, this can help, as I, as I will uh, explain. Um, the, the result of these sound laws is that you have sound correspondences, because from Latin not only Italian developed, but also other languages, Spanish, Portuguese, and so on, you, you probably know this. The result is that you have certain correspondences between sounds in, in these daughter languages, and you can make use of them. For example, English and German both come from Proto-Germanic, and often you have a T in English and a Z pronounced Z in, in German. For example, two, zwei, and uh, and other examples of that of that kind of that kind. Uh, I want to explain this in in such a way. Uh, you have these numbers here. I don't know whether you can maybe you cannot read them from from there, but I can make them bigger for a few sen for a few seconds. So, so you have these numbers. Uh, if, uh, please look at these numbers for a few seconds and, and uh, try whether you can observe something with these numbers. Do you, do you get the point? What's up here? Um, we haven't got so much time, so, so I will explain this. Um, you always have this number in this column is always two higher than this number. For example, 3,464 is two higher than this. This is two higher than this, and so on. And these numbers are always four higher than these. This is four higher than, than this, this is four higher than that, and so on. So, what can you do then? What is the, the consequence if you want to remember the numbers? You can think about that while I make the smaller again here. Um, if you want to learn, if you simply want to learn the, the numbers by, by heart, um, the thing is, you, you need only really remember the, the numbers in the left column, and then you can calculate the other numbers. You just have to keep in mind, add two, and then you, have to, and then you get the second column, and add four again, and then you get the third column. That's the point. In this, in this way, you can uh, calculate the numbers again if you forget them. And now you ask me, what has this got to do with languages, right? Um, here we have two languages, 
And um, the language in the in the left column has the words tor, suor, nuori, nuori, poli, and so on. The other language has the words to, so, nor, pol, nor, uh, pol, and so on. The, the, this language is in fact Finnish and this is Estonian, but it doesn't really matter. The point is that you also observe a regularity there. You always have or here and you have or there. And if you know this, that a Finnish or corresponds to an Estonian or, it is much easier to remember to remember all these data. You, you only need the native data in one language and then can more easily learn the, the data in the other language and you can, so to speak, calculate it again what it should be in, in that language. It doesn't always work, it doesn't always work. We'll have the questions later, by the way. It's, it's best when I first give the whole talk and then we can uh, we have a discussion and questions later um, in, in order to, to save the time. Okay, so my third point is some frequent mistakes when learning languages. Um, some excuses not even to start or not to continue. Um, uh, maybe I need not tell you this, but uh, there, there is no too old for languages. You're never too old, and it's even good for you if you have serious mental problems of some sort. That's that's a different <laughs> topic, but, uh, but otherwise it's, it's of course good uh, for your brain if you learn a language. You're not, you're not uh, too young either. Uh, but uh, don't torment any children with, with something if it has to be a voluntary thing, otherwise it's not nice. And uh, uh, the next point, do not believe the story with being untalented or not gifted. I would not believe that because uh, um, it, it is a stumbling block. It hinders you from approaching things. I have several points here. Um, why Why is probably no one entirely untalented for languages? One is A, um, each one of us has already learned his native language. This is a different to maths, right? Everybody has a native language, but nobody has native maths. So if you, if you say I'm untalented for maths, you have an excuse because you don't have any native maths, but you have a native language. You know? Right. Uh, it, it does not work exactly the same way to learn a second language, but, but nevertheless. Uh, B, your success does not so much depend only on talent, but also whether, on whether you have access to information on how to do it. You can use the information that is new, known in the, in the Polyglot community or by Sprachlehrforschern, this, uh, this branch of how to learn languages, or that by Bodma or by Kleinschwood, these are two authors who wrote on that, uh, yeah, and so on. So uh, C, um, from your mental capacities, you need a bit of everything. You need a bit of logic, you need a bit of memory, you need a bit of intelligence, a bit of emotions. I think this is, this is very good about languages. You, you need something here, something there, something there, and so on. So if you have some weaknesses at some part, or if you believe you have some weaknesses somewhere, maybe another area can compensate for something. I think this is very fair about languages. It's, it differs here from other areas that you might need to learn in your life. And there are links to many errors. For example, what I'm saying in this, in this diagram, languages have a connection to computers somehow because you find videos on the internet and that. Languages have a connection to people, of course, uh, because you speak to people. They have a connection to politics and social issues and so on. There's a connection to music, of course, because there's, um, there, there are songs and, uh, yeah, and um, it's, it's something acoustic. That's another point and so on and so on. So many approaches to language are possible, and you can choose your own uh, own approach, what, what, what fits you. If, if you don't like one approach, maybe another one is, is good for you. Uh, next point, you, you might say people speak English anyway, like, like me at, at the moment. Um, or another important language in, in one corner of the world. Partly this is true, but A, a knowledge in English may be limited, not everyone, uh, not everywhere there is a good access to, to learning English. And not everyone considers English important, and it's, it's also people's, people's right to not, to not to be a fan of English, so to speak, right, for whatever reason. Um, uh, and B, this is even more important, the atmosphere is entirely different when you speak uh, people's language, and, and uh, even if you do it just a little, you know, England it's a different matter whether I speak Finnish uh, or whether I speak English to someone it's uh, the atmosphere is completely different right as to foreigners in your own country you can have the attitude uh, they must speak our language for example in, in Germany uh, we have lots of foreigners 
uh, you, you can have the attitude, yeah, you must speak German. And that's true, I think. Uh, if you want to live in Germany, you must speak German. But it's also nice and enriching if you speak a little of, of their language too. It's not mutually exclusive. Uh, negative feelings toward a particular language, uh, face checking whether these are in reality due to some person or fact or incident connected with the language and not due to the language itself. If you don't like a language, why is it that you don't like a language, right? Uh, it could be, uh, I have some points here, A, B, C, D. It could be A, your teacher in that language at school or somewhere else was unable to explain things that you weren't successful at school as a, as a consequence of that. Uh, so maybe it was more rather the, the teacher's fault and not so much your own fault. Um, B, your teacher in language Y treated you in an unfair way. Maybe, of course. So maybe in that way you developed uh, yeah, prejudice against language Y. C, you experienced some people speaking language there, acting in a way you don't appreciate. Or D, the language is connected to a climate or to a religion or to a culture you don't feel comfortable with. Usually it's not the fault of the language itself. Usually the language is nice, but <laughs> other circumstances maybe uh, were not in your personal life. Um, thus the negative feelings can often be abandoned in this way. So this is a bit of an encouragement that I'm trying, that I'm trying to give if, if, you, uh, if there's a language that you hate. <laughs> you know? uh, maybe, maybe this can change. And then I want to say something about the belief that language X is too difficult. I hear this uh, a lot of times. Uh, it's too difficult, this is too difficult, that is too difficult. It's true that there are differences. That's true, I admit that. There are undeniable facts about complexity, for example. Icelandic is more complex than Danish in, in morphology. Um, the relation to your native language uh, is different each time. For example, Chinese is more difficult than Dutch if you start from German or from, from English, right? Uh, it depends on where you start. Complexity in orthographies and writing systems. Irish is more difficult than Romanian, I mean to spell it, right? And uh, if you take two languages with foreign scripts, Chinese is considerably more difficult to write than Korean, because Korean has a, has a very simple uh, system. So, uh, but uh, many others have mastered the, the language before, so this is also an, an, an encouragement, unless it's a quite exotic language. Children have mastered it, this is always valid. I heard rumors that uh, some languages are difficult, for example, Icelandic or Finnish or Hungarian or Arabic. Uh, they are a bit more demanding than others, but uh, by no means unmanageable. The fault is often not with the language, but with the descriptions or the explanations or the books and the teachers and so on. So, um, some more general point. Uh, uh, one must not despise industriousness or diligence. One should be industrious, one should work hard, and this should not be, some, this should not be a taboo to do that. Mm, uh, the, the wish to have fun exclusively can be can be damaging. <laughs> um, fun is possibly only partly present uh, and an overall result of the process. Um, one should not want too much, it will always take some time. And uh, if you want to learn a large number of languages, it will of course take some time to do that. Uh, trying to be perfect, that can also be a problem because you never become really perfect and to trust any method, that's, that's also another, can turn out to be a problem um, because there are many methods that do not really work. <laughs> Thinking that newer methods will always work better than older ones, that's another point. It's not always that the newer things are better than the older things. Uh, sticking to a book or teacher, of course, a method that is bad, the insight must be certain, of course, but that this is the case, but then um, you can abandon that and find a different way. Um, some points concerning particular issues. Uh, some people think having music in the background is good. I don't, I don't think that. I don't believe that. Uh, I think it's better when it's quiet when you learn. When you are learning. Um, time consumers are, for example, if you look words up individually, uh, and you, you should have a book which provides you with a vocabulary from the foreign language to your own language. And dull exercises, you can, you can skip them without having a, a bad conscience about it. <laughs> uh, I think this is really my, my opinion, my experience. It works without that. Um, 
spending times on things you already know, this also can be a time consumer. Courses or groups in which many participants are slower than you, avoid, avoid them. It's often good to <coughs> not to attend a course, but to do things on one's own. The next point, don't be afraid of grammar. Um, uh, grammar is, is nothing terrible, it's just a way, it's just a word for something like structure or the way things are done. And if you want to keep to the grammar of a, of a language and speak with a, with a correct, uh, so to speak, uh, language, uh, grammar of a language, that only means that you want to do things in the way that the native speakers do them too, in order to have a good communication. That's, that's everything that's behind that. If you see, if you look at grammar in this way, it's, it's easier to accept it, I think. And um, don't be surprised if things work in a different way from your first language, Any, anything can be different. And sometimes things do work like in your first language, don't be surprised in that case either. Only immersion, that's another thing I want to address. I think that's bad for the beginning if you go to uh, a country and or if you go to a course and they don't say a single word to you in your in your own language that's uh, a waste of, of possibilities there are many possibilities to explain in your native language something about the foreign language and for a later stage it's good to have only the, the foreign language uh, around you then then it's good right um, because what happens, what happens when you don't have explanations in your native language? If you just are confronted with a foreign language, what happens? A, B, C, and D I have here. A, you're never sure of the meaning of words. That's one consequence, and that's, a, that's really an annoying consequence. Uh, you ne you're never sure whether it means this or that, and a clear translation into your native language is really what you deserve. <coughs> Uh, second thing, the grammar won't develop correctly by itself. It's better if you have an explicit explanation of it. C, people speak too fast when they're at normal speed, so analyzing, learning something is seriously hampered. And D, everything will last ages. Yeah, and you can be happy that you are not a child any longer, but you have background knowledge that can be used for learning a foreign language. Later in the learning process, immersion is okay. The language does not drift into you automatically in the country. Yes. So, uh, next point, some basics about, about language learning. Do I have a tool for, for learning languages? No, I don't have one particular tool, but, uh, but a whole, um, whole long list of tools. Um, a mechanic does not have one tool either, and the doctor do does not have one tool either. So a good language learner should not have only one tool, but, but a lot of tools, and to um, employ them. Um, what I use for each language is I don't use one textbook, I use several textbooks. I use five or ten textbooks. I get them all from, from libraries and I read them in a parallel way. Because, why, why not only one book? Um, uh, the reasons are, each book has about 500 to 3,000 words, possibly, possibly less, possibly more, but I checked it for one book, for a book about Hungarian, uh, Langenscheid's Praktisches Lehrbuch Ungarisch has 1,900 words. Now, if you learn these 1,900 words, this will be too little for a real conversation. And thus it's better to have several textbooks, on Hungarian in this case, and learn the vocabulary from all of them and add it all up. Of course it repeats, uh, partly, but partly it doesn't repeat. So your, your, your vocabulary becomes bigger in this way if you, have, if you proceed in a parallel way on, with, with several textbooks. You need possibly 5,000 to 10,000 for, for a conversation. Uh, progression in the difficulties of text is usually too high and not naturally. Uh, usually these textbooks are, um, they have more, more grammar, but the development of the vocabulary is not with the pace that it should be. You should have much more vocabulary and less grammar. That would be more natural to have it that way, but books are not that way. If something is explained badly in one book, possibly it's, it's better elsewhere. If available, use textbooks with several volumes. Um, yeah, uh, use paper and pencil, write something down, not too much, not too little, news. use cassettes or CDs, use a dictionary, use an etymological dictionary, this is very good, if you look up the etymology, you also have uh, something to memorize, if you have understood where the word comes from, this helps you to memorize the word. This, this is a good trick. And um, use a basic vocabulary if one exists. For example, Langenscheid's Grundwortschatz Russisch, uh, which is uh, on, on Russian for, for German speakers. 
And I used linguistics, most of all the sound laws that I was talking about. For example, Finnish or Estonian or, if you have this correspondence, it's much easier to, to remember the Estonian vocabulary if you already have the Finnish vocabulary and vice versa. And talk to speakers, another important thing. I think I will get back to that. Nowadays I employ an addition, you know, I started off when there was not yet so much computer stuff and so on when, when I was young. Uh, nowadays I use a computer too for texts, videos, films, emails. I write a lot of emails to people from all kinds of places, but for my job, not, not just for fun. It's, it's uh, serious matters really that I'm uh, usually talking uh, about. And uh, online dictionaries, online courses, for example, for, for Icelandic. Richard gave a, gave a tip on, on, an, on, a, on a good Icelandic course on the internet, with to live Iceland school. So I, I, I watched that, and uh, so I got to that course, and, and it helped me very much to, um, to improve my, my knowledge of that language. Uh, what to do varies with the level. One said, for example, phonetics must be attacked at the beginning. Phonetics, orthography, uh, you know, pronunciation. Only later go to that country, but start off in your in your own country. That's that's better. And only later watch TV in that language or read original text. Otherwise, it, it might uh, uh, take your motivation away. In the following, some tips on language learning are given. Some additional tips are given, and I distinguish between external factors, that is things like uh, motivation, organization, and so on, and internal fact factors that, that I speak about, uh, the language structures themselves. So, um, I, I do not read everything out which is here in, in these notes. Uh, external factors, a good motivation is that, that it's fun, but it's not always fun. Um, sometimes sometimes it's, it's work, but in, in the end, it's somehow always fun that results from all that, you know. Maybe you had hard times with the language, but in the end, there something something happens again in your life where you speak the language and where it's fun again. These these moments will occur, so uh, maybe this is an incentive. Um, you become faster with a number of languages. That's another point. <coughs> the, although ten languages may take you a long time, the next ten won't take the same time. You know, you, be, you become quicker then. That's a good thing. It's, I, thought, uh, I thought about this, I think, yesterday or something. It's like with making money, the first million is the hardest one, you know. <laughs> After that, the second million isn't, isn't, uh, isn't that difficult. Uh, I'm, I'm still struggling with, uh, with making the first million. <laughs> okay, um, uh, another incentive, you obtain a secret language. Not, not for everyone here, so I think uh, my, all my secret languages do not work here in, in, in this room. So, uh, but, but in general, you can use it for, for your notes. Uh, uh, what's not bad either is that, that the textbooks you use often have nice little stories and they always have a very nice world they live in. I remember the first uh, book on English that we had in school, it was uh, Mr. Clark and Mrs. Clark and Betty and uh, the children, Betty and Pete and so on. It was a very nice world and everything was okay. You know, they had a, they had a house, they didn't have any problems with jobs and, and so on. And there was no violence in the family, they didn't have, <laughs> there were no, they were not addicted to drugs or nothing, nothing like that, you know. That's also very nice, I think, with textbooks and, and you encounter this nice world uh, every time. Or, a student goes to a different country, that happens in that book, and everyone smiles, everyone is friendly. It's, it's completely unlike reality, but <laughs> it's very nice to see that there, yeah. <laughs> um, it seems to work to learn a language only if you have a real link to the language somehow. My experience it is that it's difficult to learn a language only because then you have one more. Somehow the brain protest against that and then you get what you deserve that it doesn't really work the, the, the language doesn't enter your brain it's not for adding them up just just like that so uh, next thing some organizational matters there are both arguments for learning on one's own for example what independent and for learning in a course in a course you have more control but other people control you yeah? right um, you can also mix the two in general I think it's good if you are the master of your learning process, if you decide things yourself, that's in my, in my experience the, the, the better way to do it. Um, if you want a course, obtain information from universities or from Folkehoi School, that would be the word in, in, in Danish. 
uh, certain institutions where you can where you can um, learn something. For example, languages too. Uh, unless you're going to have your level checked and so on. Use libraries, it's, it's cheaper. Use libraries and you have less inhibitions to buy lots of books, uh, to, to, to get, to, sorry, to, to, to get lots of books because uh, it doesn't cost you any money. So you can get these five to ten textbooks on the same language. You can uh, possibly get a, a basic vocabulary of that language and, and get other things. You, you use them and then you give them back one day. Um, <laughs> you, you have less in inhibitions to borrow great numbers of books. Uh, uh, is, it, is it because of that that, that, that you're laughing? <laughs> I wrote this explicitly here. Yeah? It's better than if, if you buy this all. Some further tips on textbooks. Uh, you can also use textbooks which are older, from the 70s or 80s. It, it works. There are certain words that we'll be missing. For example, cell phone or mobile phone. You won't have a word for that in that, in that book, but it's not, so, not such a big problem. Sometimes there are orthography reforms, but this is rare that they are far-reaching. For example, modern Greek, where they abolished all the accents and that, and Greenlandic, they had also an, an orthography reform, which was a bit more far-reaching, but otherwise, um, mostly this, this is irrelevant, and also some books, uh, also books work that are some decades old. Uh, for exotic languages, you must accept that your access is through a different language. Well, if you want to learn Mordvin, for example, you have to go either through Russian or through Finnish. Right. For the beginner's level, a book must not be monolingual. Yeah, I talked about that already. So, and the system, if you have the original text on one side and translation on the other side, that's perfectly okay. So don't have a bad conscience if you use such a book. Some books have too many big pictures. That's nice, but uh, they just take space away. That's my opinion. And some have touristic information in them. Also, that takes space away sometimes. The phonetics should be explained somewhere. An IPA transcription would be good. It depends on how much is necessary. That depends on the language. There must be texts in that book, and not only sentences. There, are, there is a book on Georgian, for example, where for, for, many, for many lessons you just have sentences, and you're supposed to translate sentences all the time, but no text. That, that doesn't make sense, I think. The choice of vocabulary should be good. Uh, each vocabulary item uh, can be more or less important, and you should learn the, the, the most important items first. Stick to textbooks as long as you can, because they have advantages that, that won't come back, such as the grading of the material, the vocabulary supply, grammar explained, and so on and so on. Use original text in this time span only if you want to. And only after that, use original text and talk to speakers. Some tips on original material. If you want to use things that, which were not designed for, for learning purposes, poetry. Poetry is not recommendable, I have to say this. Uh, poetry is very nice, but the problem is that a poet really uses the whole language and, and does whatever he or she likes with the language, and that can be very difficult for the non-native speaker who wants to learn the language. He, uh, new words are make, made up and so on. Music, it, it depends. Partly, there are the same problems with poetry, there's also slang and so on in music. Um, but there are also easier texts, and the music itself might disturb. I mean, the, the, the music, which is not the lyrics. <laughs> and it's best to have the, the lyrics um, on the screen. There are YouTube videos with the, with the lyrics. Uh, you, can, you can look for them. Learn the word for, for um, subtitle in, in other languages, and then you can look for, look for this explicitly. Films, films are not very good, especially if it's about complicated stories with crimes and so on. Uh, films are not very suitable. If at all, I would watch them at a computer where you can stop the file. Novels, I would not read novels uh, without pictures. That's not, that's not so good. They're too complicated. But comic strips are good. I definitely recommend comic strips because the pictures help you. The pictures help you to understand the story and uh, to acquire vocabulary. And children's books, I did not list this here, but children's books are also useful, also because of their pictures and simple language. The importance of talking to people. This is, of course, a, a crucial point. Talk to people. An extroverted personality is good for, for that. <laughs> and automatically speakers will help you. They will complete sentences. They will offer alternatives and so on. Uh, a rule of thumb is the smaller the speech community is, the more they're pleased to, to hear you speak the language, even if it's just a little. 
There are certain strategies for conversation. You can express your, you should express yourself in a simple way and so on. And and uh, accept, you must accept that you sound a bit weird in a foreign language. Avoiding mistakes is not so important. I think this is nothing new for you because this is exactly what what you you, you can learn from a lot of videos on the internet, right? Uh, try to get uh, information on, on variation of a language and be aware of this table. This is also an important point. You have um, four skills here which can be arranged in such a table. You have active skills and passive skills and you have acoustic skills and optical skills. So we have speaking here that is active and acoustic, listening that is passive and acoustic, and understanding, of course, if possible. Writing is active and optical, and, pass and uh, reading is passive and, and optical. So these are the four skills, and it is usually easiest with, with the reading because it's passive. Passive is uh, easier than active. Not always, because uh, it's not, uh, the choice of words is not free then. And optical things are better because you have the time to stop and acoustic things have a certain speed and go on. So final remark, learn from polyglots and hyperpolyglots, the motivation, psychological factors. Uh, motivation alone is not enough. I, uh, people talk a lot about motivation and that's perfectly okay, but it's, the motivation is, is not the only thing. You also um, need um, need to know something about the, the language itself. And this is now the, my next uh, uh, chapter and my last, uh, my last uh, big chapter in this, in this talk, or section in this talk. Uh, I think the real key to success and, and to speed in language learning lies in handling the internal factors. Um, Make sure you are aware of what a language consists of. There are languages of le language, levels of language structure. There's phonetics, morphology, syntax, and so on. I'll talk about that now. This is, this is what the section is about. I start with phonetics. Pronunciation is often underestimated. Bad pronunciation can distract people's attention or can make you unintelligible. Uh, the quality of your pronunciation has various effects apart from how you understood. It's also, it's also the, uh, yeah, the atmosphere and how seriously uh, you are taken. If, if you have a very bad pronunciation, this, this, has, a, this has, a bad, uh, has, a, has a bad effect. Um, so... Each language has a fixed inventory of sounds, mostly between 20 and 60 sounds, and you should be aware of what these sounds are, and you should distinguish them all in your pronunciation. Not every sound needs to be exactly as a native speaker pronounces it, but uh, try, to come, try to come close to them and do not mix them up somehow. Make sure you know IPA, International Phonetic Alphabet, right? Or whatever your, whatever system your sources use. Phonotactics is the area which is concerned with how sounds can combine. For example, in some languages you have certain consonant groups. In Slavic languages you often have certain consonant groups that other languages uh, do not have. And you have to get used to that too. Have access to recordings or to statements that are slow enough and that are clear enough. Mm. and be aware that phonetics is something that, that somehow concerns y your body, not just your brain exclusively. Uh, on orthographies, I want to say, I would like to say that in most languages there is a largely regular relationship between spelling and pronunciation, at least in one direction. From the spelling you can draw conclusions to the pronunciation. English is a, is a bit of an exception, as well, but although there are many regularities as well, in other scripts, if the script is clo rather close to your own, um, it's, it's not so difficult, but otherwise you can use a transcription or transliteration or Roman romanization or something. For example, for Georgian or Armenian, that's perfectly okay. That doesn't mean being lazy if you, if you use a, a, a Latin way of writing Georgian or Armenian, for example. For Chinese, it's recommended to learn the pinyin system, and for Japanese, kunreishiki or hebonshiki. 
Uh, for some languages, um, it's, it's good to have some knowledge how the scripts develop, for example, for modern Tibetan or Burmese or Thai, if you want to learn that, because the scripts are very conservative and the pronunciation has changed a lot in the course of the centuries. Um, uh, on the grammar, I would say this. First, have a bird's eye view on, of the grammar. First, um, be aware of what what the language has and before you start learning something uh, have an overview what what the language has and what there will be to, to learn in, in the next time to come and as to difficult grammar distinguish between the real difficulty of the grammar and the merely apparent difficulty which arises when you get bad explanation that bad explanations that can be a real stumbling block and learn the grammar. I am someone who, who defends that, that one should really, really learn, the, uh, learn the grammar and not just uh, skip it all the time, you know. Um, if, it, if it works, yes, but often, do, often it doesn't really work if we don't learn the grammar. And uh, then, then I have a, a few terms that one should know. Morphology, syntax, part of speech, paradigm, affix, prefix, suffix, inflectional class, morphophonemic, alternation. I can't go through all of them now. And you can act yourself and draw your own tables for that language, invent your own graphic devices and so on. Um, be aware of derivation, for example, these are some Polish examples here. You can see how in one word you have a K and in another one ch spelled C, Z. For example, mleko, milk, mleczne, milky, smak, taste, smaczne, tasty and so on. So if you are aware of this um, alternation between k and ch, this is helpful. Uh, with mistakes, um, one should not uh, worry too much about them. On the vocabulary, there are a few things I, I want to say. Um, uh, the vocabulary is very large and um, uh, the, the grammar comes comes to an end somewhere. I think the, the biggest problem with a foreign language is always the vocabulary. It might not look like that uh, at the beginning. It might be that there's a uh, the, the grammar is the problem, but the, the vocabulary in the long run is the bigger problem because you always have gaps there somewhere. And for the for the communication, it can be um, can be more fatal. You can use a computer uh, program to learn vocabulary. And um, then uh, be aware of the structures that this vocabulary somehow has. And there is one, there are a few things that I still want to say about that before um, before I come to an end. You can associate, for example, um, this this here, this example. I have to make this bigger too. Um, no, I won't. For example, if you can learn, if you learn Finnish, you can learn omena means apple, right? You can take the word omena and learn that it means apple in English. But it's more effective if you associate the, the word, the Finnish word omena, directly with this here. <laughs> this is an apple. If you associate there too. There you have another omena, right? <laughs> so, this, do, do you feel how this works? Do you feel how, how, how well this enters your brain? It's much easier to associate directly the word omena with this object here. It enters your brain. And it enters your brain less if you associate it only with the English word apple or with, with whatever your native language is. So, and this, this goes for, for everything, of course, not just for apples. <laughs> and uh, so what, ha what happens in your brain, there is another thing I want to make clear here with this example. I have here the Basque word unzi. If you look at these lines, um, I'm sorry this always takes a few seconds to make it bigger here. There you see two lines, right? You see the Basque, this is from Basque, the word unzi, and you see here ship. If you read this line, what happens in your brain? You read unzi, and you wonder what is that? What does it mean, you wonder? Then you read ship, the English word that you know, and then a ship comes to your mind. Then you imagine a ship, a ship is in front of your eyes how a ship looks, right? But when this happens, that the ship is in your, in your, brain, in your brain, on your, on your mind, 
the UNSI is possibly already uh, is already far away. If you do it the other way around, if you just swap the columns, that's the trick. What happens then? Here we have ship. You read the word ship, you know it because it's English. And then the ship comes to your mind, and then you read UNSI, the Basque word UNSI. And then the ship is still in your mind, the picture of the ship is still in your mind, and you can associate it more easily with the word UNSI, because it's more effective. So swap, swap the, the columns. That's, that's the trick about it. Or, alternatively, if you don't want to do that, uh, read from right to left. <coughs> read the columns from, from, uh, from right to left. I have to get back the size here. So, some extra tricks. You can read dictionaries. If it's not too boring, do that. Or read the vocabularies of textbooks. Unless you get bored by uh, <coughs> un until Until you get bored by it. But it, it works. And um, so this is, um, I'm coming to an end now, um, a bit about the surroundings, uh, make sure that other things in your life also work well, not just the language learning. And one question, can languages be addictive as well? I, I think yes, I think yes, because addictions can be to, to, to a lot of things, to, to surfs, uh, but also to to things, uh, how you behave. And uh, what traces do I leave on the earth for friends, colleagues, family, society, and so on and so on. So these are some questions to, to think about. And uh, well, this was this was basically what, what I wanted to say. And I, I wish you uh, good success with, with your language learning. And thank you very much. Does, does the microphone work? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. So, if you have any questions, if you have any questions, uh, hi there. Thank you so much for your talk. It was very thanks. fascinating. In, in fact, we did, we don't really have have much time. Okay. Just yeah. oh, quickly. Um, it's my fault. My question was. Um, I am someone who is likewise um, bored out of my mind when I am going through a language textbook and it's telling me about the story of Mary and Jane and they're going to the store. Mm -hmm. And um, fiction is a staple of these language learning textbooks. What would you suggest for people who are more interested in nonfiction, in history, in culture, in things that really exist? Um, so, sooner or um, do that later. I mean, first you have to get the basics. Uh, of the language somehow, and this process is always always similar. At the beginning, you can you can choose the text you're interested in, but you need very simple texts about uh, yeah about um, you know everyday situations and so on. And later later you can choose what you read. It's a question of deciding that later. Yeah. So you told that the. Uh learning, like connecting the word with the real object is uh, much more effective, but how about the pictures, as uh, lots of apps use the pictures and a lot of pe uh, people I've heard, they use the internet picture to assign with the words, uh, yes. but for me, like with the audio, I feel it is way much more effective for me to speak with the real person than hear the audio book or whatever. So I guess it's like the same way. It's yes, better it's to see the real ship. Yes, yes, it's, it's something you have to do too. All these things are correct. You have you, you can learn in, in some way and associate uh, words with objects and so on. But you, of course, you also have to talk to people. That's that's very important. So it's it's all it's all valid. It's all it's all true. Oh, it's uh, more more or less about uh, the artificial thing, which is picture. I'm not assigning the with real object. It's like picture of some object which connects me to the object, but the way it is like longer. Mm. And it doesn't really work with every word. There are words which you cannot directly associate with an object. If they're about abstract ideas, for example, it doesn't work. Then, then there's no picture for it. So it works only for some for some words, for for a part of the vocabulary. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, clearly the sound for ship is oons, 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 oons. 
<laughs> okay, yeah, that, that's another thing. Uh, I couldn't, uh, there were so many things I could have said in this talk. Uh, you can use anything you want in order, in order to remember a, a word, and don't be afraid of that. You can have the craziest ideas how to remember this word, uh, unzi, for, for ship, for example. So it, if it works for you personally, that's, that's fine, and, and it doesn't matter if it's a, if it's a strange uh, idea how to remember a word. Yes. One question. Uh, you said that uh, linguistic uh, helps in, uh, can help for learning languages. Is mm -hmm. there some basic, simple book that would explain uh, this to help? Because linguistic is by itself uh, quite um, a big job to... It's, it's difficult, it's difficult. I have some books here, uh, but um, all have their shortcomings too. You can, le you can read this one, it's a few decades old, by Bodmer, Frederick, The Loom of Language, you, could, you can read that. But there are also wrong things in this book, and uh, it's, it's not very good, it's really bad what he writes about African languages, for example, and so on. But for Germanic and Romance languages, uh, this book can, can be read, and it, it contains some tricks, it's, it's a very old book. And the other ones, some are more theoretical, so... The, the videos on YouTube are often more uh, bring you further, I think, than, than, than these books. Some of these are, are linguistics books about, uh, about um, second language learning, mm, unfortunately. Uh, we, we can, there is room for improvement. There is room for, bigger, for, for, for better books still. There is some possibility to, to do something there. Yeah. Yes. So maybe... Oh. Um, just to come back to what you said earlier, when you uh, compared Finnish to Estonian with the sounds, yes. I think this only works if, uh, if it's systematic. Yes, yes. And it's not always systematic. Yeah, so that's, yeah. that's true. It's, it's systematic most of the time and then it works. And then you have the ua and all, but it doesn't, it doesn't always work. It's a long story, of course. I had to... I had to be so short in this talk. I could have uh, talked talked on for for ages and ages, and, and and you know, and I had to skip some things and so simply because there's so much that cannot be said in so so little time. So, unfortunately, yes, <laughs> unfortunately, that was it. So, thank you very much, and it uh, it was fun. Yeah.